Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks so I can review the signs of a mother with narcissistic traits, specifically in the context of a mother-son relationship. So I'm talking about traits here that the son could observe. I answer this question by looking at the 10 signs of a mother with narcissistic traits. Now, when we talk about narcissism, we know we have grandiose narcissism and vulnerable narcissism. All types of narcissism have someone being self-centered, having a sense of entitlement, and requiring admiration. On the grandiose side, we see characteristics like being socially dominant, extroverted, arrogant, and resistant to criticism. On the vulnerable side, we see characteristics like having a lot of shame, distrust, being introverted, being hypersensitive to criticism, and having a lot of resentfulness. Now here in this video, I'm really looking more at the grandiose side and even kind of a subset of characteristics within grandiose narcissism. So one of the things that can happen with a mother who is narcissistic is that she can ignore a son. And I'm really not focusing on that as much. I'm looking more at over-involvement. So too much attention, the wrong kind of attention, like criticism, and problems with affection. Ignoring, of course, can still happen, but again, it's just not the primary focus here. Now, the mother-son relationship is really a critical bond. To some extent, it becomes the template for other relationships that the son will have. Having a narcissistic mother can do a lifetime of damage within just a few years, right? So again, this is kind of a critical relationship, and when we see narcissism introduced, it causes a lot of difficulties. There is significant overlap between the behaviors of mothers with grandiose narcissism and what we call maternal antagonistic parenting. These are parenting behaviors that cause or facilitate negative feelings in a child. When we think of maternal antagonistic parenting, we often think of guilt trips and unkind comments, and both of those will be reflected in these signs. Now, as I go through these signs, I'm going to refer to the term mother. When I say that, I mean the mother with narcissistic traits. It's just easier to say mother. And I'll be looking at different stages of development. So when the son is really young, when the son is getting married, when he's older, a lot of these different stages are reflected in these signs. I'm going to run under the assumption that the son is married to a woman, so there is a daughter-in-law in this equation. So let's get started with sign number one. The mother says that she's on the side of the son, that she's going to advocate for the son, but she only really does this when it is in her best interest to do so. So when she's trying to protect herself from embarrassment, she'll advocate for the son to make herself look good. She'll do that. She'll confront people like teachers and neighbors, again, when something's at stake for her. However, interestingly, she will not come to the aid when the son, when he really needs her to, right? So just because the mother has some interest in advocating for the son doesn't mean the son wants that. When he wants something, when he wants his mother to be on his side, she's not there for him. So the son figures out that his mother is defending her own interests and does not truly care about him, or he develops a distorted view of what it means to advocate for someone else. Sign number two, the mother is unaware or unconcerned with the needs of the son. Part of this is really just the lack of insight we see with grandiose narcissism. So the son can be isolated by the mother. So the mother might prevent friendships when the son is young. She might say they're too dangerous or the friends aren't good enough for her son. She might just be jealous of the attention that the son gives to friends. So again, she'll prevent these relationships or sabotage these relationships. As an adult, a son looking back kind of at his childhood when he had a narcissistic mother, often feels as though his childhood was stolen. I hear this quite a bit. So he didn't really have the complete experience that other people had because of the isolation, but also just the fact that the mother was never aware of what he really needed. Sign number three, in many cases, we see that the mother had a poor relationship with her mother, right? So the son's grandmother, she was never shown love, only coldness. So she developed an insecure attachment, or perhaps a dismissive or avoidant attachment, but not a secure attachment, right? That's really the only one that's healthy all the way around. So she was starved for affection, rejected. She felt worthless, 
and narcissism stop that pain for her, right? That's what narcissism does. It protects somebody's ego. So the thinking of the mother becomes, based on her experiences with her mother, I will not be the victim again. The pain was too great. The loss was too much to bear. I'm not going to be rejected again. So the son will love her. The son must love her. That becomes the thinking, and it's not really open to being changed very easily. Sign number four is emotional neglect, right? So the son was emotionally neglected. We see very little warmth that's communicated, that's shown by the mother to the son. Now, we know this lack of warmth is linked to what they call callous, unemotional traits in the son. And this has a relationship to antisocial personality disorder. So in one sense, it can be linked to criminality. We also see that this lack of warmth can be linked to depression and substance use disorder. Now, emotional availability is one of the key factors for developing secure attachment. And again, secure attachment predicts a number of positive outcomes. Any other type of attachment tends to predict negative outcomes. As part of this sign, emotional neglect, we see that the son does not want to share his emotions because in that relationship with the mother, there was no emotional reciprocity. We don't see appropriate emotions going back and forth. The son was never taught how that works. He did not have the freedom of emotional expression. Specifically, he could not express negative emotions. And that's really part of that maternal antagonistic parenting I talked about before. Now, this situation where he doesn't like to express negative emotions because of those experiences, this is reflected in his romantic relationships. Sign number five, the son believes that he can never be good enough for the mother. So when he was being raised by the mother, he really saw that it only takes one mistake to be thought of as terrible. That's how it works with narcissism. It's not really logical. On top of this, even when the son followed the mother's directions precisely, his behavior could be labeled as being a mistake. So there was really no winning with the mother with narcissistic traits. Now to the mother, only certain mistakes matter, right? This is another kind of interesting dynamic we see. Mistakes that affect the mother directly, these are terrible and horrible and the mother has a strong reaction to them. But mistakes that don't hurt her in some way or affect her directly, that are just bad for the son, she's not really gonna worry about those as much. And this is part of what causes the inconsistent discipline we see so much in these relationships. So the son can do all kinds of things that are not healthy, but the mother's only gonna punish him for those behaviors that directly affect her. Sign number six, the son functions as an extension of the mother because she has blurred the boundary. So he doesn't learn how to cooperate with other people and he doesn't learn to have a healthy level of competition. The son's success proves the mother's worth. It makes her valuable. The son represents the mother's greatness. So his failures may be ignored or criticized, right? So he gets, again, maybe a mixed message sometimes. It's not always consistent when he fails. But of course, when he succeeds, the mother is pleased with that. As long as other people can see that success and it reflects positively on her. So the emphasis is really on image. So because of this, actions that appear successful are also rewarded. So if people believe the son won an award, they did not win, and he wants to go and correct that situation, the mother might say, don't worry about that. Let people believe you won that award. To the mother, that's all she really wanted. She just wanted to have other people see that she accomplished something great through the son. It doesn't matter that it's not real. It doesn't matter that there's dishonesty involved. To her, it's the same thing. Sign number seven, the mother repeatedly indicates that everything that she has done in her life is for the benefit of the son. So the mother sacrificed everything for the son. She gave up or limited her career. She earned her education for the son. She stayed in the marital relationship or the long-term partnership with the son's father for the benefit of the son. So what we really see here is the guilt runs deep. This is a critical part of this relationship. The guilt trip is really the main weapon at every age of the mother and of course at every age of the son. And I think that's because it works. The guilt trip is a very successful technique for accomplishing the goals that the mother has. 
Sign number eight, the son won't reveal flaws to the mother. Now this one might not seem like a big deal all the time, but in my opinion, it's actually one of the more worrisome signs of this type of dynamic. The son fears criticism. He's never heard any type of criticism expressed in a helpful way. To him, it's always been the same as being ridiculed. The mother doesn't know how to criticize in a healthy way. The mother never set an example of admitting fault either, right? So he doesn't really know what that looks like. This particular sign, not revealing flaws to the mother, not appearing vulnerable to the mother, will always limit the growth and the depth of this relationship. And it'll always limit the growth and depth of any relationship that follows the same pattern. So that's really one of the concerns. Not necessarily that the son specifically doesn't want to talk about his shortcomings to the mother, but that he's going to adopt this as part of his personality, part of his relational style, and kind of go through life with never wanting to be vulnerable to anyone. Sign number nine, the mother sets up scenarios where she is chosen by the son over the son's wife, the daughter-in-law. So for example, the daughter-in-law schedules a party, the mother schedules an event for the same day. She's forcing a choice. So the son has to choose and she knows the son will choose her. And this kind of reinforces her sense of greatness. It reinforces her position. She wants his loyalty to be with her. She doesn't just want to be number one. She wants to be the only one. And this takes me to sign number 10, the last sign here. The son works to help his wife become accepted by the mother, but the conflict is always there. So this is interesting because the mother kind of sets up for the existence of the daughter-in-law years before she's in the picture. She warns the son that someday when he gets married, that she will be challenged by this, that that daughter-in-law will not like her. That daughter-in-law will interfere in their mother-son relationship. So the mother says the daughter-in-law is never good enough for the son unless the daughter-in-law is deferent to the mother. And even when she is, the success the daughter-in-law is going to have here is usually somewhat limited. Still, the daughter-in-law may try. She may say things to the mother like, I can never be as good as you. I don't know how you do it. You're so successful and great. I'm so lucky to have you as a mother-in-law. In this type of scenario, sometimes the daughter-in-law becomes an extension of her mother-in-law as far as the son is concerned. So the daughter-in-law may become an agent of their mother-in-law. This is unhealthy, obviously, for the son because now he's kind of fighting a war on two fronts. He's got that relationship with the mother that doesn't work, and now a daughter-in-law that's really pushing the agenda of the son's mother, right? So this can become difficult for the son, and now it kind of extends into really more areas of his life. This is often when we see people coming into counseling, right? This is a point where now somebody kind of feels surrounded and they see those narcissistic traits kind of extending to other people and they want help. They want something to change. Now, often when I do see sons who have mothers who are narcissistic in counseling settings, one of the difficulties for them is they really want to limit or even potentially end contact with that mother. Now, this isn't always the answer, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it's the only thing that actually helps. Many sons have a really difficult time breaking off contact with their mothers, which of course makes sense. And one of the things that I think is helpful in the situation that I've seen helpful kind of in my clinical experience is reminding people that you can disagree with someone and you cannot want to have a relationship with someone without being their enemy, right? Being somebody's enemy is different. Protecting yourself is one thing, being an enemy is another thing altogether. This message, of course, is the opposite of what the mother taught the son for many years. So those are the signs of a mother with narcissistic traits. I know whenever I talk about topics like narcissism and relationships, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of the mother-son relationship to be interesting. Thanks for watching.